we talk about the uh, different uh, traditional approaches of uh, strengthening a concrete beam. And uh, that the most convenient way of strengthening a beam is using fiber reinforced polymer. Uh, basically, at a very, very early stage, like uh, uh, 15 years ago, maybe, uh, FIP material was very expensive. So at that time, people actually simply buy FIP strings. They actually glue these strings into the beams. And now, of course, people just use a uh, uh, like a, a cross. So it just basically just cut off and uh, uh, so that you can you can just uh, glue like at bottom to make it basically that FIP material will be uh, considered uh, additional reinforcement. And uh, but. That, that most of, uh, there's a lot of research done by many, many different universities. And uh, uh, the, uh, the research shows that uh, the best of, if way to reinforce a concrete beam is build a, this kind of little bit of U-shape to cover the edge, to cover the edge of the, the beams, uh, so that that gives you much uh, better bonding and also uh, better confinement, because ultimately, when you keep on loading, ultimately the concrete, the concrete will crash, and, but that's not good uh, ways. But typically, concrete should not crash, and uh, there, sh there should be a year yearling of uh, reinforcement, and the probably the breakage of these uh, FIP uh, fibers. So that's the preferred way to uh, give you more ductilities. But. Uh, that, that's for bending. Again, as I said, if you have crack in the bending, sometimes you may need not, need not do anything. You just do some calculations to see if there are deficiencies. If there are no deficiencies, probably the crack will seal by itself. But if you have shear crack, like if you have shear crack, that will be a totally different story because shear crack itself reduces the, the shear capacity so that, like, a, very much certain that if you have shear failures, a shear cracks, you may have to fix it. So traditionally, uh, to fix that is you just uh, provide uh, like a post tension rod, which is anchor that to form a triangle, or you may, uh, sometimes you may just simply bolt a steel plate, very much like a perpendicular to the uh, to the crack. But that is okay if, if this is not visible to, to the public. Like, uh, if, if it's another, if it's, a, if you have a, a highway or street, and then is people see that, they might say, well, that bridge is in danger. Look at these <laughs> things. And uh, so, in, the, in that case, traditionally, what you need to do is actually you need to call a, a big hole in the middle of these beams which is very long coring, and then you put like a pre-stressing steel inside the holes to tighten it. So again, that's very uh, time consuming. Nowadays, you can easily do by using FIP repairs, like, a, uh, like a, they had a crack here, and all you need to do is just apply FIP. FIP is like, a, Something you actually need to design, you need to calculate. It's not like a, a band aid. If you have, a, if you have a, a cut, you just put a band aid there. Actually, that's what happened. And I had, I have, I have a, a friend, a very good personal friend. He owns a couple of parking structures uh, in 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 Washington D.C. And one day he called me. He said, "Jim, why well, my uh, concrete beam cracked?" And uh, I, I want you to do something like uh, wrap ups, like uh, the black things, wrap them up. Uh, I say, oh, you mean the, uh, the uh, strengthening the, the concrete beam? He said, yeah, yeah, whatever. Uh, I, uh, I said, uh, let, me, let me take a look. So I did some calculations. I found that when he designed this structure, he wants to minimize the, the clearance, uh, I mean, minimize the structure height. 
So he did, and the, the beam is very, very shallow, and uh, so that it's, it's like, a, like a reverse T shape. So you ha they have like a double T. It's not Holocaust, it's a double T city on like a reverse T uh, uh, fringe. And so that T is cracked. Uh, cracked. Uh, I, I did some calculation I found actually it was a, a slightly under design. But normally it will be fine, but somehow the, the, like the, they, will, they, will have, they will have repairs on another level, so they have a very heavy construction equipment. Uh, so if it's just a passenger cars, probably it will be fine. And the cost of crack. I told him probably if you, if you prevent that from happening again, probably you don't need to do anything, because it does not really affect the capacity. It's just a crack doesn't look good. Like he said, I need to uh, do something. I, I need a professional engineer to do something so that I feel comfortable. Uh, so I say, okay, let, let me do some calculation. Uh, so I calculate, and uh, I found that I tell them, no, I cannot do anything. The reason I couldn't do anything is that I found that because his beam is so shallow, it, it reached the balance condition. In other words, when actually the more load comes, the concrete will crash. So, so no matter how more reinforcement I add, it does not increase capacity anymore. I told him, I, I said, no, I cannot do anything because I, I told, told him the situation. And later, actually, I think one day I, I passed by that. I actually parked my car there. I saw well, somebody actually fixed it for him. Then I, I, I told him, I said, did you find another engineer who may be better than me, did better calculations? He said, forget about it. I called a contractor. Contractor said, he can fix it. He just wrapped them up and it's done. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, as I said, I said, OK, because it was designed for uh, like a much heavier load than the passenger cars. So when the passenger cars pass by that, it should not have any uh, problem. But whatever he did, it will not really increase the capacity by much. A box girder, box girder is very much similar to regular beam. The only difference is most box girders are, are post-tensioned. So that, that's something you need to pay attention. And also box girder may have a, like problems at the diaphragms. The diaphragm is a, some kind of solid uh, elements inside the box, inside the, uh, the uh, box. I'll be uh, discussing that later. So like, uh, typically, if you see a crack in the middle of the, like in the middle span of like a beam, norm, like, uh, then normally it will be like uh, caused by bending. If you see the, like a crack in the top and you have a support, it may be caused by negative bending. And if you see it, like, this kind of crack all over, typically it means the failure of, uh, of like uh, bearings. Like especially if, if we're in an environment like uh, like winter is really cold, summer is really hot, because you have a lot of movement. And if the bearing doesn't allow you to move, it creates a, a stress. So that stress is uniform. So that may cause that kind of failures. And that kind of failure typically is at joint. Like a lot of precast box girders, they heavily rely on glue. Like epoxy glue them together. So if it does grow well, so they might crack there. And if you see this, that kind of support near, uh, near the uh, support, that may be caused by like shear stress. Shear stress typically in a web. So the pre-stressed concrete and the regular concrete is very much similar. When you do a repair, pre-stressed concrete, you may have to consider the distribution of uh, stress. In other words, if you have a pre-stressed beam, and then later you add a conventional reinforcement, like FIP is considered conventional. So when you low, uh, initially, they may not distribute stress equal. In other words, it's, it takes a while for the later added member to, uh, to develop full capacity. Sometimes 
the concrete may reach the compression limits. And so that, that's something you have to uh, verify, especially if for very, very shallow structures, as I mentioned just earlier. And so, so the, sometimes you may pre-stress your additional uh, member. That, that is typically done, but in many cases I find after uh, structure analysis or calculations, you find it's not necessary because that costs a lot of money to do, to pre-stress the member in, uh, inside, especially if, if it's internally. Externally, you can build up brackets and do that. And first of all, uh, do any repairs. You need to do inspections to discover any problems. A post tension inspection is extremely difficult and because uh, you, you really cannot see anything and you cannot take them out. They're fully, they're fully uh, grounded. So the grounding material is a problem. And a lot of, like, uh, in the early, early uh, 1960s when the post tension bridge was first introduced into the United States, most of the bridges were built in Florida. Florida built post tension at a much earlier stage than other time. At that time, the grounding material is not very good. Uh, so people used, uh, we call grout a long time ago, like if, when, we, when we build a steel. Here, I don't see a lot of steel building. Uh, like in the United States, most buildings are steel, so it's much faster construction. So to build a steel building, typically you, you have a folding. Then you have anchor bolts cast, cast in the folding. Then you erect your steel, uh, steel column. And the steel column usually has a base plate. So a base plate, steel column, base plate is a weld into that. So they put in. And uh, then they have to adjust the a bolt to, to adjust that so that the column becomes very, very vertical. To do that, actually, there's a gap between anchor, I mean, base plate and the bottom folding. So that gap needs to be grouted. So the grout is something, like they use that a lot. So when it, uh, build, when it started building uh, post tension, they use a similar grout, basically just a, a cement with a, a fine aggregates like sand and add water. So that, because they did, did not have any, uh, other chemical components into that. So the problem about that simple grout is that when grout was pumped in into these like, uh, ducts, they typically they were pumped from like a low end, like a low end. So pump, they were, like, a grout would go up and up. And at, usually at, over the piers, they would have a tube getting out. So they would see the grout coming out from tube and once they come from tube, they say, well, it's fully grouted because they're all grouted. And uh, then they just uh, let it settle. So the, uh, the problem is that uh, the cement and sand is much heavier than water. So they segregate. In other words, before the, the concrete uh, fully hydrated, uh, they, they segregate so that there will be a, a lot of water in the top of the uh, dark, and uh, so that this water become uh, uh, eventually may evaporate and become cavities, and then once you have uh, salt or other corrosive uh, chemicals get into the uh, ducts that cause collisions, so that, that's one uh, reason. Uh, another reason that and the way that a pump is so that although the the, the grounding material is going low to high. They typically don't actually fill the whole, cap, whole duct. There are a lot of cavities. And actually, engineers or contractors know because they calculate like they may need how many uh, liters of grout. And uh, after finish, they see there's a lot of grout left. <laughs> but they don't know where these cavities are. So all these are cause, uh, like, uh, like uh, when you do uh, cross sections, there's a lot of cavities. And nowadays, people improve quite a lot. So they add a lot of um, chemicals into this grouting material, make them settle much faster. So
so that they don't segregate. And also these chemicals tend to uh, produce a an uh, alkaline environment, as I said, so that keep a pH value high and to prevent collusion. Mm, again, actually, recently people discovered this kind of new cloud has problem of self. So uh, uh, there's always problems uh, out of that. So that, that's an improvement of cloud itself. But the construction method also changed before they pump from low end to high. Now, actually, they use a vacuum. They suck from high end. When they suck the growth, they find that, that, that that's a, a difference of cross sections. And uh, they find that when they do the sucking, there's a little chance of form cavities. Because of the, when you do the pump, the, the pressure to, uh, introduces much smaller than when you do the sucking. Sucking, they introduce bigger. Uh, pressure difference between inside and outside. So, uh, so as again, during inspection is extremely difficult. And typically, what people do is that they use a borescope. I don't know if, if anybody has done colonoscopy or something. Uh, like a lot of older people here, but uh, like, a, like a doctors may insert a small tube into your internal organ. And that tube has a, like a very little, little like a tiny light at top, at the at end. And also a video camera, so it can see that. It's the same, same instrument. So they just draw a hole, small hole into your duct, and insert that they will be able to see what condition inside. Uh, that, that's a, a typical way, and cheap ways. But the problem is that both scope sometimes they make drill into the uh, pre I mean, post tension cables that may damage the cables. So, uh, so people may use some other expensive alternative, like such as X or gamma ray radiation. And, and these are like a borescope uh, video camera. And these are the uh, radiation. Radiation, radiation gives you much better pictures, but the problem is. Like if to do radiation, you have to have access to other side. Basically, radiation is like a, I, I have a machine which emit uh, radioactive rays, like a gamma rays typically, or X-ray. Then you have a receiver which receive that. So if there's a solid steel or something which broke the uh, radiation so that it have much, some darker, some lighter, that will give you like a black white pictures and that's how you see it. So if you don't have access to other side, then you cannot do it. For extension, again, there's virtually no way to do repairs. In, in other words, <laughs> discussing of repairs is useless. And uh, so only, only real way is add additional reinforcement. That's why for most, a post tension like box girder bridges, we put additional reserve for future uh, post tension externally, just for the post tension in, into the box. Yeah, that's uh, very much all the concrete superstructures. Concrete substructures, usually, the substructure don't have much problem with the concrete element because no matter if it's concrete uh, abutment or or the footing itself or in, in less certain like less extent the piers, they are very very large elements, so they don't usually have any ways being overstressed. So real problem is actually its foundation. So. So that, that's why most substructure repair, the concrete is non-structure repairs. If you repair apartment, if you repair piers, typically just uh, repair concrete without any significant effect of uh, structure capacities. And uh, again, it just uh, we discussed the cost of concrete uh, damage is mainly because of reinforcing Rebar collusion, once it corrodes, it has to be 
bigger because the rust itself is much larger than steel itself. So it increases the volume and that causes crack and the spalling. And uh, 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 these are the substructures, like for them, for this apartment. All these damages is actually caused by the expansion joint leakages. So, um, so in order to address that, you have to re uh, replace the expansion joint. That is again that pier. The pier bend is also caused by the leakages of this expansion joint. And uh, some uh, some people actually they may say, okay. What, what's the cause of this? And it's most likely caused by corrosion of these rebars. Because these are like, like, uh, where the stirrups are. So when the stirrup corrodes, it causes one crack. So in the uh, United States, a lot of, and we, we actually, we introduced a, a, drain, a trough. A trough is like, like a, a, rubber, a rubber strip. Like about that wide, so it's just one one side it fits into apartment, another side it fits into the girder. Then, if the water leak from apart from expansion joint, if the water leak from expansion, it will collect it by the. So you have, you may need to have a certain slope. So then eventually they will have a debris collected here. So we need to wash it. So normally we don't use that as a standard alone open joint. So we still have like a regular expansion joint. That will be produced for like second defense. In other words, if, even if that leaks, that will still prevent the water get into bearings and the other uh, superstructure element like steel girders or apartments. That can be also used over piers if you have expansion joint over piers. Like, and normally I try to design bridge and make them continuous over piers. So you try to eliminate as many expansion joints as possible, especially here if you don't have a big uh, thermal movement. You don't need a lot of expansion joints and uh, you don't need to design like simply supported beams. You can design most of exp uh, continuous structures. Uh, Another thing that like, yes, uh, comes with spoiling this due to leakages. Like when you do a, uh, when you do an inspection, like if you see like a condition like that, usually we, we call it, uh, like a, f a flagged item. In, in other words, if you see like uh, these kind of scenarios, you may need to report to a bridge owners immediately. And in many cases, they may ask you to design rehabilitation for that. And like for them, for that structure, in order to repair these, you may actually have to temporary support, provide temporary support so that when you do demolitions, you don't want to uh, let the, the good with, uh, without support. And uh, typically, typically this is caused, caused by rebar corrosion, so you may, you may want to remove, like, because they're all heavily corroded, you may want to remove concrete everywhere by an inch or two. Uh, and, the best remover is you actually remove like beyond the reinforcement a little bit. So when you cast new concrete back, it will be bound much better. If you just chip concrete without expose, export the reinforcement, they may not grow very well. And like uh, this is like. Uh, Another, another way of uh, repair shears, as again, we can, for shears, typically you can use like FIP to wrap them up. But if the damage is so large and you don't have enough uh, resource, I mean, enough ways to provide additional shear reinforcement using FIP, you may actually, you may just extend that uh, piece to, to provide additional support. That's another way, but no matter what, you may want to seal the crack, so you like inject epoxies. A foundation, as, as again, for the apartment or solid pier, 
there's really no way to, uh, no need to calculate the capacity because it's a monster solid element. Uh, but so, so most of this problem is caused by like a foundation. If they have a partial settlement, then it may crack like that, or the crack like that. So all these are, uh, is caused by foundation. Like uh, the cracks usually, you don't really repair cracks if it's active. In other words, you need to look at its reports from previous report to see if this crack has been stabilized. If they're stabilized, you can like, see the crack. If it's not stabilized, probably you need to address the, the foundation problem. And if, like, uh, to seal, to inject the crack is relatively easy. So you basically just, uh, it just provide, like, uh, there's like a plastic, uh, a plastic, uh, like, a wage type of uh, thing, which has holes inside. So it just, uh, like, draws, draw like, small holes every, typically three to uh, about a meter apart, and it just, uh, for that is a plastic wedge into that, and then you just put a seal strip to seal the crack, and then you just inject epoxy from low, and then epoxy will go up and get high getting out. Then you just seal seal here and then inject another, just going from low and go to higher. Another thing that. Uh, there's a peer column. The peer column, uh, it, like this is another highway, so uh, that's, that's in Maryland. So in Maryland, we use a lot of salt in the winter. So, so if we have a lot of salt for the, uh, for the highway here, like here, then when a the, when the truck or vehicle comes, they may splash the salty water into the column, so that causes a lot of uh, damages. And also, the, I, I found that like, uh, the, the spiral for this column is so big. Normally it's like a, typically like a three, four inches of spacing. This is like a more than a, a foot of spacing so that you don't have enough like a confinement. Sorry. Uh, not what? It's not, no, just like a, a column, peer column. No, I understand that. The, 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 in the storage belt, and when you have a, a, the nonlinear behavior, you understand the point when it appears to fail. That's one of that. Oh, oh you were talking about the. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, no. No, 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 it's, it's not. These can never develop a plastic hinge in the first because you have a very, very good confinement. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll talk about uh, that uh, later in the earthquake design, and we have an earthquake uh, retrofit. A plastic hinge is very, very important concept that greatly reduces your design load. In other words, the, the earthquake comes from earth. That's, well, that's why it's called earthquake. It does not come from sky. So when we calculate load, we assume force applied to the uh, superstructures. But in reality, the force comes from ground. So if we can have like a ways to separate, like for example, I have this uh, table here. No matter what magnitude of earthquake, there's no much stress on these because when the earth shakes, <laughs> these and the earth does not even connect. So they don't have uh, develop a lot of force. It's the same concept. If I have a big bridge, very, very heavy bridge, but when earthquake comes, the magnitude, the maximum force that, that, that my bridge can experience is actually my resistance of that pier. So you know, if my pier has that much bending capacity, so that's it, no matter how big. After that, my, my uh, uh, like a, a column will yield, provided you have such ductility and the bridge will not collapse. So once you know the bending here, you know the height, so that will be how much the maximum earthquake load will be able to apply to the superstructure. Yeah, but again, that, that difference here. But actually, you have to remember, 
Most of bridge columns we use circular because we can provide much better confinement and much better conductivity. Uh, so, and these is not actually very good design. So it has such large. So that's why, that's why when I do a repair, I find I need to do a lot of confinement. But you cannot put another reinforcement inside anymore. So what I can do is I wrap up with FRP to provide very good confinement. And another advantage of FRP is because FRP does not allow water to penetrate that. So that effectively provides a good shield for that. And that, that's another thing, which actually that's a, in, in very, uh, that's, these two bridges are very close to each other, probably within one kilometer. They're all in the city of Baltimore. That's another, the designer has a, f a funnier way of, because this is actually, it's inside the city. In, uh, there's actually side, there's a sidewalk actually. There are a lot of people walking around here. So the designer doesn't want to have drainage pipe goes down to be visible. So what he did was design a drainage pipe cast in the column. And that's really good ways and so let the water come out. And the, the problem is most of the bridge at the debris is like a tree leaves in the in the fall. Like here probably it's a little bit different. In, like in in Maryland, all the tree lost leaves during the winter, <laughs> before the winter I should say. So that in the in the fall, that's why they call fall, they don't call autumn. Force, tree leaves force down. So all this eventually be washed into the drainage system and uh, that broke that. And uh, it was used for like cast iron. Cast iron usually has very good corrosion resistance, but eventually have uh, has salty water inside if I, if, and they were corroded. After they corroded, so the, all the salty water get into concrete. So that concrete was become very, very poor. Actually, it has to be reduced a, a, a lot. I remember it's almost one third of concrete was removed. So you have to actually provide temporary shoring to do that. And after that, uh, we did the same thing with the FIP to wrap them up uh, to provide uh, additional protection. And uh, also we put like, the drainage pipe outside so that you can repair that easily. And this is how this, uh, that, that project, that project, that, that's how they wrap it up. To do wrap up, actually, you don't need to have much overlap. It, you don't need to have overlap at all. It just, uh, it just wraps them like with drawing. Uh, so that, and the reason that actually they provide confinement only, just like uh, the spirals reinforcement. And actually, the, this will, once you do that, it increases tactility a lot. The tactility is defined by the, the deformation before failure and deformation when it yields. So the bigger the ratio, the, the better the tactility. So uh, it's very essential uh, uh, characters for earthquake design of structures. And that's like a concrete quality is something very strange. Like a, Sometimes we say, if I see it, I, I, I trust it. But sometimes I see it, it may not even be something you can trust. You have to do a, a test. Like this is one bridge uh, in, in, in the Mississippi state. And uh, it was made of like concrete arch. They have, they have a pre, I think cast in place, concrete arch, like a slab about that thick, just an arch. And then they have concrete head walls, so they have the walls. And then it's become a container, so they have a, a granular, basically just like a granular material, uh, like sand, like a crashed stone, and put in. Then on top, they have ash for pavement. So it's really good. The only problem is the ash for is not like a watertight material. So when the rain comes, the water actually can penetrate through ash, ash for. So once it does that, the water has nowhere to go. So effectively, the whole thing becomes a water container. It's all water, and the, so that will cause a lot of corrosion and the, uh, for this slab, and especially the head walls. So originally, we, uh, the owner said they want to replace that. And we did the inspection, and we did some corings, and we found actually the, most of the concrete in this 
These arches are actually very good qualities. So we recommend just keep the bridge. What we did was re we removed that uh, concrete, the head was, of course, first we removed the railing and removed the ash for and removed the material and then exposed these uh, concrete arches. And then we just all do re local repair, just treat that arch as like a normal bridge deck. We did all kind of a, a deck repairs. And after that, we provide water proving membrane just to wrap them up. And uh, later, we just build these head walls back. And, but we put like, a, a perforated uh, drainage pipe inside us and uh, let it go out. So when, when the water does go in, it can get out. And uh, so that, and uh, later, we just uh, did very much the same thing and uh, provide granular material and pave back. So it looked the like same as before. So concrete repair materials for, again, for normal repairs, normal repair we don't deal with, for bridges we don't deal with large quantities. So you don't usually use any form. In order to have a form, you probably need to have about like a, a four inches, which were like a hundred millimeter gap. So to, in order to put concrete, you can vibrate, uh, like a consolidate effectively. But we don't usually want to build a structure like bigger than before. So typically we use like a, we use a concrete repair compound. Repair compound is like you just apply like a manual. It can be even overhead or vertical. So you just apply that without need for any forms. And these are typically just a simultaneous materials. They have sometimes sometimes they add fibers like either synthetic or metal fibers. And also they have like uh, chemicals, uh, like for example, latex or polymer. And uh, so that, that these are just uh, the repair compound. Repair compound typically like, come with like a the bag. You have instructions. All you need to do is just add water and uh, you can do the um, hand uh, repairs. So to do repair, typically just any repair, and you, it, you always make sure that, like for example, if there's a, like a, that kind of damages, uh, repairs, so you don't, need, you don't cut like that. Usually you always cut like a rectangular, and probably like a six inches from each edge and cut just rectangular. It's a lot easier to cut rectangularly and easier to repair. And how deep it has to be really depends on how, how much deterioration. If it's very, very shallow, you don't have to expose the reinforcement. You may just have very, very shallow repair. But very shallow repairs don't last long. And uh, so typically you want to expose the, the, uh, the first layer of reinforcement. And then actually even uh, dip, like, uh, remove a little bit of concrete around the river so that when you cast back, the new, the new concrete or repair compound will be able to grab the river so that it won't fall off. And uh, also, uh, it's also very practical to apply a bonding agent, a box bonding agent, just so they will bond better and also seals any like a crack in the existing concrete, as we just discussed, like overlay. So that, that's typically for hand repairs. And if you have a large abutment and you want to do that, that becomes too labor intensive. Usually what we do, we use shock creed. It's just like, a, I don't know if anybody has seen like shock creed operations. It's almost like a, a pump, yeah, just shoot at the concrete so it will form that. Yeah, these are typical, a cigar is a, a typical product and a Grace is another brand name. They are all very similar. Like when you, for any government project, you cannot specify any brand name. You can only specify the, the specification, in other words, of what will be minimum requirement for each product. And then the different manufacturer will be able to uh, uh, supply the material to the contractor so they can bid. But for private project, like for example, if I have a friend who has a garage, needs to do repair, I say just buy such such 
the prior back of the thing, he can do that. Oh yeah, just like uh, yeah, these are the typical, typical like you cut like rectangularly. Like yeah, that actually, I don't I don't know how he can that. Typically, you would cut like uh, like that. You don't have you don't need to cut like small funny shapes. Uh, again, like uh, again, uh, the, this will be very similar. So, and like it, it could be very shallow repairs or like uh, half depth repairs. Sometimes, if there's a deterioration underneath the bridge, also where you can have full depth repair. That's why, for each of the bridge uh, repair project, I always have three types of repairs, and then I summarize quantities. So that when contract the bid, they will have bid the price for this repair, union price like a per square meter, and bid these price per square meter, and bid four depths for square meters. And uh, although the design will show that, but I always put a note say the final quantity should be delineated by the engineer outside. So actually, once once you uh, do the like a. Uh, Remove our first layer of concrete, you will have better uh, knowledge. So that, that, then the engineer will actually use different colors, say these color and that. They just draw that lines. So that color means the fourth I've cut, they will cut for that. But they don't actually cut, they will let, leave the reinforcement inside. They just remove all concrete so they can put the form and then just cast these. And that different colors, so they will do this, they will remove concrete until the uh, first layer of reinforcement. And then they will have another color, so that then later the, they will do the measurement and uh, keep, a, keep a record of quantity of each type. Then they will send an a invoice saying, okay, that's a type one repair, how much square meters type 200 square meters, they will be paid based on that. And like sometimes if we really need to uh, cut, like if we have very, very large, if we have very large area needs to be repaired, and you just chip concrete off, keep reinforcement, it's very, very tedious work. You might just soak the whole thing. But when you do soak the whole thing, you just actually, you soak, uh, oh, no, sorry. You actually, you, you, you cut most of the reinforcement, but you leave certain, certain reinforcement at each edge, so that then you can have a, you put a, a like a, a new rebar, then you have sufficient overlay so that you don't have, have a bar couplers. And of course, you can just cut all together. Like, uh, you can cut all things together, then you may have to put a bar couplers to couple them together. So that will be difficult. If you can cut one side, it's OK. If you couple both sides, it's not possible. In other words, you may have to couplers and have new bar to overlap in the middle. So that, that will be like, the final product, yeah. And shock rate, as I said, if you have a very large areas, you can use shock rate. Shock rate does not require any uh, uh, forms as well. Of course, you could uh, have formed the design. Like, for example, if we have a really, really big retaining wall, and uh, increase the thickness is not the issue. So you can actually provide a, a like additional concrete, just cast concrete into that. So what time do we uh, stop? Twenty four thirty. Uh, four, okay, four thirty. Yeah, it's almost four thirty. Okay. Yeah, we can uh, because these are the, uh, the longest uh, uh, sections, so we can continue because I saw a couple of people already left the last patient. So. <laughs> mm. Yeah, we can continue. But before that, uh, I, I don't want you people to remember the questions they want to ask until tomorrow. So any questions so far? OK, yeah. 
as a teacher, I always give high, like more grades to people asking questions. Like even if he may fail, I may give him some extra mark to make him <laughs> not fail. So that's why that's why how I remember like students' names. So that, that's why asking questions is always a good idea for any students. Okay. Okay. I have a question where, where when you are using a chart grid and how do you measure that the how can I say this? The if the concrete that you put there has uh, some connection with the older so Yeah, no actually that two two elements. One is the bonding. Actually the research fund there's no really issue of bonding of because chalk grid like, is usually very, very high strength. No, they will be like almost twice stronger, especially with fiber than the original concrete. So there's really no issue uh, of separations, of course, you could just apply, which is typical, apply a bonding uh, agent. Bonding agent is basically just a paste of epoxy. Uh, it's like, uh, that, that will give you much, much better bonding. And the real problem is the corrosion, because and the, especially for deck, for other elements may be fine, because in a deck, there's a lot of uh, uh, Corrosive material, typically it's just a chloride because people use a lot of salt in the existing con deck, concrete deck. And then you have a new applied concrete. Of course, for concrete deck, we don't usually use chalk grid, which is the regular concrete, although high strength. And this new concrete has no uh, chloride content. So it will develop a differential of uh, Basically, just voltage. If you will, uh, so the voltage differential will develop a mini circuit of electron, electronic circuits that may corrode the existing and the river in contact with old concrete more than the new concrete. So that, that's why people find like uh, they, they actually accelerate the corrosion for the. Uh, river which uh, can in contact with old concrete at the, the boundary condition areas. So to, to mitigate that, normally I would recommend you to put a couple of zincs, like just we mentioned, the zinc to sacrifice itself to protect concrete. Yeah. Uh, any Oh, if you don't have more questions, I appreciate everybody being here and see you tomorrow.